Malachi. We're looking toward the end of chapter 3. We're going to begin reading in verse 13 in just a moment. You know, years ago, uh, Karen and I had a slight problem at our house. Uh, The timbers that I was using uh, to landscape near the house uh, began to uh, erode, for lack of a better word. And you know where I'm going with that. I picked up the timber and it just began to crumble and I realized we had termites. And that was a big problem. And uh, so the first thing we did was we removed the timbers, got them as far away from the house. Then we called an exterminator since they were very close uh, to the house just to check out the structure. You know, it's one thing to uh, lose a a $10 timber. It's another thing to have structural damage to the house. Thankfully, uh, there were no problems. And, you know, I thought about the work of those termites. They didn't come with trumpets and announce. They weren't very loud. They were working in the dark. But the result of their work uh, when they were not dealt with uh, was very visible. You know, sin can do the same in our lives. It can sneak in It can take root many times in a quiet, unsuspecting way. And before long, sin, like termites or like weeds, they don't just want entrance. They want to actually dominate and take over. And that can happen in one's life. And as we look at the people in the days of Malachi, we see evidence, outward evidence, of inward damage, of sin that was existing in the people there. We have looked in the last few weeks at how they did not acknowledge God as they should be acknowledged. As we saw last week, they weren't giving the right quantity back to God. They weren't giving the right quality we saw earlier back to God. Uh, The covenant of marriage was being dissolved and disrespected, and the people were questioning God. Yet as we look at the sins of the people in Malachi's day, Uh, There is one sin that is addressed in two different chapters, and it was the sin of a critical spirit. A critical spirit, the outward manifestation of a heart uh, that was marked by sin, of a mind that did not understand the things of God. In Malachi chapter 2, we saw it as God was speaking and saying that their words were burdening them. And today he revisits it and he talks about uh, their complaining. You know, a critical spirit can, can be a very serious thing. I heard the story of a man who received a call from the emergency room. The doctor was on the other line and said, uh, Sir, I want you to know that your wife is in uh, the emergency room and she's very critical And the man responded, you'll just get used to it. (laughs) But God wasn't used to the critical spirit of the people in Malachi's day. In fact, he was angry with it. And, And even as the destruction of the work of a termite, we see that this critical spirit began to manifest itself and and was corrupting their very being. Look with me at Malachi chapter 3 beginning in verse 13. The Lord says, Your words against me are harsh. Yet you ask, How have we spoken against you? You have said it is useless to serve God. What have we gained by keeping his requirements and walking mournfully before the Lord of hosts? So now we consider the arrogant to be fortunate. Not only do those who commit wickedness prosper they even test God and escape let's pray father as we look to your word today I pray you would speak in in these moments as we study your word we thank you um, for the full counsel of your word and how we can learn from the sins of others that we might avoid those things and father one of those things that is so prevalent in our lives, we confess to you, is that of a critical spirit. And so, Lord, speak in this time together today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, a critical spirit is a spirit that readily finds fault, not in self, but often 
in others, and it can manifest itself verbally in a number of ways. This critical spirit that's that inward work, we talked about the inward work of the termites, that that inward work often manifests itself outwardly through gossip, um, through slander, through a judgmental spirit toward another person, and sometimes just very simply through complaining. And as we've looked at these people in Malachi's day, uh, we have seen a number of sins that were evident. But in the midst of all of that, we see they possessed a critical spirit. You know, as is the case any time when we study God's word, we're called to do a self-inventory. And it's very important that we ask ourselves, God, do I possess a critical spirit? Many times this spirit develops over a period of time. God, is, is there an attitude or a spirit of complaining in me? Is my speech manifesting a heart that's not dedicated to you and a mind that is not aware of the blessings that you've given to me? So as we come here in Malachi chapter 3, we see a final indictment against the people. And again, it's a repeated indictment. And and the good news is next week we're going to move to God. I I thought about uh, going and and combining and finishing out all of chapter 3, but I felt like it was too much of a reach to try to keep it all together. So next week, we'll move toward God and his judgment in the coming day. But today, we see a final time when he's speaking to the people, and he's simply saying, your lives are not consistent. Your lives are not pleasing to me. And so uh, as we look at it today, I I want to look at the fact that not only were the people here critical, but they were critical toward God. He says in verse 13, your words to me are harsh. They're stout. They're strong. They were boldly coming to God and they had a complaint. We've already seen, as we said in chapter 2 and verse 17, that their words had burdened the Lord and such was the case here. And in both cases, they were saying, God, you're not fair. God, you're not fair. And we need, you know, to be careful of what we say. And we need to be careful of the spirit that lies behind what we say. But we most certainly need to watch our words. James 3 is likely uh, the most famous scriptural passage on our speech. And in verse 2 of that chapter, James writes, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is mature and able to control the whole body. In other words, the test of maturity, James said, is our speech. And if we have a critical speech, a gossiping speech, a a complaining speech, then that is a sign of an inward state that is not in a position of maturity. And he says, if you stumble in that, it manifests it. Now, the people in Malachi's day were certainly stumbling in what they were saying about God. They were presenting baseless complaints about God. In fact, importantly, we see that the critical spirit, the critical talk, was really the manifestation of one, hearts that were unconsecrated to God, and two, minds that were undiscerning of the blessings of God. You see, the roots of the speech were these two things, the unconsecrated heart, the undivided mind. You know, in James chapter 3 later, uh, James shares something that's really profound about our speech. He says, does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same spigot? In other words, the spigot is merely the end result. It is the well that is the source of the water. And so what he is saying there is the spring, when it gives forth, it's really the source of that is the problem. And so as we look at Malachi, the symptom of the problem, the outward manifestation of the problem was critical speech. But the source of that problem is they had hearts that didn't truly love God and they had minds that didn't truly understand the work of God in their lives. And I want to look at those two areas today. First, The people in Malachi's day, obviously, they had hearts that were unconsecrated to God. They weren't set apart to God. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else. Even 
above your mouth. Why is that? Because the heart is the source. Jesus himself taught that the outward acts of sin really begin in the heart. And so above all else, God says, guard your heart for, it, for from it are the issues of life. It is the source of life. And the point being here is that if your heart is right with God, then in this case, your speech will be right with God. But their speech wasn't right. They were criticizing God. And the problem was this. They were serving God for their own comfort. They were consumed with themselves. They were looking and saying, hey, we're serving God and our life is tough. But look at those pagans over there. They're living it up. Well, well, for the moment, maybe it appeared that way. But, but there was a revealing of a wrong heart and the wrong service in this. And it was this, that they were serving God for what they could get from him. But if we set our, par- our hearts apart unto God, then, then God's glory in, in his being elevated is our priority. You know, in Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10, there's a brief parable. It's not really recognized often, but it's a parable of a servant. It said, what servant, after he has worked all day and then served his uh, master, would then sit down and say, serve me? No, he would say, we've only done our duty. And what he's talking about that is the attitude of service is not, God, I'm going to do for you, so now you do for me. But God, I'm, I'm a servant of you. I'm a servant of you. And the people in Malachi's day, they didn't get that. They thought that being the people of God was just a pass for their own convenience, for what they desired to have. And so in verse 14, you've said, it is useless to serve God. And then there's a a, a key word there. What have we gained by keeping his requirements? You see that? What have we gained? What's in it for us? We've served you, God. Now you turn around and do for us. Why have we walked mournfully before the Lord of armies? What do we see here? They were thinking about themselves. And because they were thinking about themselves, they were allowing a critical spirit to begin to question God. They weren't in their hearts consecrated to God. And if we possess a spirit that is critical, especially toward God, we need to look at our hearts. But I want you to see a second thing inwardly. Not just were their hearts unconsecrated, their minds were undiscerning. Simply put, their understanding of their situation was clouded by their sinfulness. They could not see first their own sinfulness. They couldn't see it. My high school class celebrated uh, 40 years uh, last night, and I'm glad the church sent a representative, Harriet, to be sure I behaved myself. She was a teacher. She was a teacher, um, and uh, Karen and I did behave ourselves well, and so did Harriet. We had a lot of fun. You know, I I love going back and seeing uh, old friends, and we had a guy, his name was Bobby. I haven't seen Bobby in 40 years, actually. And it was great to see him. He came in from Roanoke. I was sharing with a few people earlier today. Bobby was actually the most brilliant reader I've ever seen. Literally, when the rest of us in class were reading C Spot Run, he was reading the Lynchburg newspaper. He was reading books that were about that thick. He had, and he's still a voracious reader. Um, but we realized Robert had a problem that was not detected. Today, they detected very early. And that day, he got to middle school. He took a sports physical, and he had an eye exam. And they said, Robert, read what's on the chart. And he said, what chart? He could not only could he not see what was on the chart, he couldn't even see a chart. And then they realized that he had a problem seeing. The people in Malachi's day were spiritually blind. They may have felt like they knew a lot, but they could not see what was right before them. They couldn't see their own sinfulness. Can you imagine God when he's listening to this, these complaints, you know, and he's saying, okay, are you hearing me? Didn't you just realize you're bringing 
de deformed animals, second-rate animals to me? Don't, don't you know that I just said you weren't bringing enough to me? Don't you realize you're disregarding your marriage commitments and you're complaining? And here, you're going to come to me. You see, they couldn't see their own sinfulness. I want you to see uh, the follow, uh, follow their reasoning here. Their reasoning was this. God, we're righteous. The arrogant that we're talking about here who are prospering or not. And by the way, you're prospering them and it's your fault. You're not fair, God. You see, their minds couldn't see their own sinfulness. They were too busy with their critical spirit condemning others and questioning God that they didn't have time to look at themselves honestly. Psalm chapter 19 is one of the great chapters in the Bible. And the beginning of the chapter speaks of God and his greatness in creation. But as we move on in Psalm chapter 19, as compared to God, the psalmist understood his own sinfulness. And so he writes in verses 12 and 13 to God, who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me, God, from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Now, what is the psalmist saying here? God, change me. Do you ever go to God and say, God, help me see my hidden faults? Do you ever go to God and say, God, change me? Or are you always ready? God, change my situation. God, change my neighbor. God, change my coworker. The attitude of the psalmist is, hey, God, I don't even really have the knowledge in my mind to understand my sinfulness. Help me to see it. And so the psalmist is saying, change me. Malachi's people were saying, God, change you. They were disobedient, unconsecrated, unholy, consequently undiscerning of their own sin. And they had the gall to challenge God. And when we get to that point, we're in dangerous territory. But I want you to see a second thing they could not see. They could not see God's work beyond themselves in their own time. They were so self-consumed, they could not see God's work. Look at what it says there, here in uh, give me just a second here. I've lost my thought. Verse 15. So now we consider the arrogant to be fortunate. Not only do those who commit wickedness prosper. They even test God and escape. Notice what they said. So now then. Now. What they're talking about is their present tense. They weren't able to look. They were looking at their situation in the moment. Now there were two wrong views that they had. They could not see behind them what God had already done. Remember, God had taken the disobedient people and their forefathers. He had fulfilled the promise that he gave that he would raise up Cyrus as a great ruler. He had brought them back into the land. He had blessed them. He had done all of that, but they had forgotten all of that. But not only that, they couldn't see into the future what God was doing. And many times when we begin to have a pity party or we begin to be critical, we're looking at ourselves and we're not looking at what God is doing. About a year ago, you may remember, I gave this illustration. If we were to go to the uh, Virginia Beach and look out across the Atlantic Ocean, the average height of a person, if you were average height, you could see about 2.8 miles. That's as far as you can see. And, and we would look at it and we would say, what? There ends the ocean and there begins the sky. But that's not right because there's a part of Portugal that's over 2,500 miles beyond that as we would look, but we couldn't see all of that. And many times in our lives, spiritually, we look at our situation, but we're not looking the way God looks. We're just looking from a limited view. And, and then we'll begin to pontificate with God and tell God what he ought to do. But God is working out a plan in the midst of everything. You see, they were looking around at others and saying, God, you're blessing them and not blessing me. God, you're doing for them and not doing for me. But they had a limited 
understanding, a limited understanding, not only of what God had done in the past, but what he could do in the future. So what was the problem of the people here? Well, obviously, the problem was manifest through their speech. They had a critical spirit. But the root of that problem is they really didn't have hearts that were consecrated to God. So they were looking around for what they could get from their relationship with God rather than serving God. They had minds that were undiscerning. They were ungrateful. You know, one of the best things you and I can possess is a grateful heart. Do you take time to be grateful? God, thank you for this. You see, a grateful heart is, is, is a heart that, that is ready to see ourselves as just the receivers of things we don't deserve. But the critical heart is the one that thinks we deserve things better than what we actually deserve. Do you have a grateful heart? So as we look at it, we see that the problem outwardly was a critical spirit, but inwardly there was corruption within. The well was bad at its core. The spigot was manifesting it. So what do we do? What do we do if we possess a critical spirit? You see, we need to take it very seriously, just like when dealing with the termites. When they were in the timbers, I needed to move them farther away from the structure. If we possess a critical spirit toward others, we need to be careful because it may move from that to possessing what we see here, a critical spirit toward God. And when we possess a critical spirit toward God, we're in the wrong. We need to change. We can't leave such a spirit unaddressed. So what we do is this. The same thing as if we were to find termites in the timber. Inspect. God, is there a critical spirit in me? Is it manifest toward others? Is it manifest toward you? And then if God's spirit reveals to you that you possess a critical spirit, then the first thing to do is acknowledge it. God, I acknowledge that I have a critical spirit. You see, these people, remember, there's so many questions here. They kept saying, what, what, why me, what have I done? Why, why, why are you saying this? The, the spirit that, that is consecrated to God, the heart that's consecrated to God, the mind that's discerning God's work will acknowledge God I, I'm, I'm critical. And then repent. If you could have pictured me that day, I didn't sit there and coddle that situation with those timbers. I moved them. I got them away from the structure. And that's what we're to do when God reveals sin in our lives, be it a critical spirit or anything. God, I'm sorry. God, I repent of it. God, I acknowledge I possess this spirit. God, I repent of it. Remove me. And guess what? I didn't put timbers back. I put stone. And so as we look at God's word today, let's inspect ourselves. God, do I possess this spirit? You see, the, the, the problem with the critical spirit is it affects our whole person. We, we see it when we live around critical people. We all can attest to it. Every time, oh, it's poor mouth in this, it's bad, it's this, it's that. And before long, what do we do? We, we try to avoid them. But not only that, not only does it begin to affect the person, but just like the termites, they don't stop. It'll affect the church. It'll affect the workplace. How many workplaces have been affected by a critical spirit? It's not attractive. God doesn't like it. We need to remove it. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, we confess to you that too many times in our life, we possess this critical spirit, and we don't address it, Lord. I know there are times in my life when I've been critical, when I've said things that are of a critical nature. Father, forgive me of that. And Father, help us to be attentive to your word today. And Father, you weren't pleased with people in Malachi's day because not only were they critical, but their criticism moved from others to you. Father, you're God and we're not.
God, you see the future, and we don't. God, you're working out your plan, not our plan. And so, Lord, as we come to you in prayer today, we just pray that you would speak in this hour. And, Father, we lift it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.